Okay, so we are now recording. And, uh, we just went through the, the roll. And, um, and we have in the line with us uh, students from Drake, Idaho, Mitchell, and Vermont. That's, at least that's how I'm going to refer to you. Um, but before we start, um, I, I'd really like to kind of get to know each of you. Um, we're gonna we're gonna spend five evenings together, and the the purpose of of the time that we spend together is I mean at about, is at bottom a very kind of simple proposition, and that is that we are going to try to get you to score as high as possible on your exams, um, and we're going to try to you know it's it's not going to be a huge investment of time with me. But I'm hoping that the time that we do spend together is valuable, is useful to you, um, and actually has some kind of measurable difference. It wasn't that long ago that I was um, in your position as a law student. I've been out of law school now for about 10 years. Um, so, but before I tell you a little bit about myself, I wanna hear about you. So why don't we start with, um, why don't we start with Idaho? So, Letitia, are you there? Yes. Okay, Letitia. So, can you just, um, uh, you know, bearing in mind, so, you know, you're gonna be the you're gonna be the guinea pig here since you're the first. And for some reason, on my screen, like you're in the center of it. Um, <laughs> is it when you talk that you're in the center? So, am I like in the center of your screens when I talk? Yes. Okay. So, um, so what I'd like to hear from you is, what do you want to get out of our sessions? I mean, my purpose is to help you to improve in your grades ultimately, but there's a lot that goes into that. So is there a, a specific area that you would like to focus on? Do you have a specific weakness um, um, that you want to work on? Um, is, is there something coming up that has you particularly concerned um, you know, and then also tell us, you know, what, what year you are, where you're from originally, um, you know, your, uh, something, you know, something kind of one fact that's kind of personal about you, your favorite show, your favorite, uh, hobby or something like that. Um, if, if we could do intros like that, I think we'd all be benefited and be worth the time because, because we are going to spend a fair amount of time with so, Letitia, again to you, and um, and please start us off. Okay, well, uh, my name is Leticia Arevalo, and um, actually I was born in Mexico, but I was raised in California, and um, I'm trying to think of something interesting about me. Well, the one thing that people tell me that is pretty, um, like a silly, interesting thing about me is that I have freckles. And I'm vegetarian, and that's a little strange for a Mexican person, <laughs> too. And so um, what I want to get out of this session would be to improve probably um, the way that I interact. I believe that maybe that's one of the weaknesses for my exams. And maybe get some test tips. Okay. Great. Um, why don't we go now to Drake, um, Brunette. Okay, so... Okay, sorry. Um, so my name is Brunette and I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I guess a fun fact about me is that my father named me after the New Jersey Nets, who are now the Brooklyn Nets. And um, so I don't really recall what we were supposed to say about ourselves, but um, I am a 1L, as everyone else here is. And um, so far after my first semester, I seem to be interested, I guess, in the criminal justice system, but I really am interested mostly with immigration law and I think 
one of my weaknesses thus far from the first semester has been like multiple choice questions. Um, I do very well with writing essay questions, so I'm pretty strong on those, but typically I seem to have problems with deciphering in between the two best answers on a multiple choice question. Okay. Um, thanks, that's perfect. Um, let's go to Mitchell. Uh, I'm sorry, who did you ask for? Sheila? Um. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so my name is Sheila Francois. I was born in Miami, Florida. However, I attended undergrad in Georgia. I'm um, one L at Mitchell Hamlin. I'm interested in business litigation. Um, one of the difficulties I faced last semester was, um, well, what my professor said is that I didn't talk about the ambiguities of, of the cases or the sides. I didn't talk about like both sides, the gray areas. Um, so yeah, that's about it. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's go to Nicole and Mitchell. Hello, I'm Nicole Harris. Um, I'm originally from New Jersey. I went to undergrad in Atlanta, Georgia. And I guess what I want to get out of this nice little Sunday evening class would be, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> Maybe, okay, we can work on analysis. How about that? Okay. Thank you. Great. How about, um, why don't we just go to Leona and that'll be everyone from Mitchell. Hi, my name's Leona Ajavon. I'm from Staten Island, New York. Uh, I went to undergrad at, Bing in, at Binghamton University, upstate New York, and what I hope to gain from this session is just strengthening my analysis skills. I didn't hear you very well. You said you want to strengthen what? My analysis skills. Okay. Good. Um, now, now going to... Um, Vermont, how about Elide, or Elide, I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing it wrong again. It's Elide? Elide, Elide. Uh, Elide. Okay. And um, I'm from Westchester, New York. I went to undergrad at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and that's in New York City. And, um, Similar to the others, I would love to um, learn more about analysis in exam writing and then also um, multiple choice. Okay. Great. Um, all right, how about Crystal? Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, my name's Crystal. I'm a 1L at Vermont Law School. Um, I'm originally from Houston, Texas. I went to the University of Houston. Um, and I would also like to work on my analysis um, and also multiple choice because, I mean, our section at least uh, wasn't really given any multiple choice tests, but we are given multiple choice questions in constitutional law for our quizzes. And so I would like to improve in that. Okay. Uh, how about from uh, Vermont? My name is Laura Wharton. I am a 1L. Um, I graduated from the University of Delaware in 2009. And something that I would like to be able to get out of this class is learning how to issue spot and 
getting better and stronger at multiple choice because my section has more has a lot of multiple choice especially in my civil procedure class so that's definitely something i have to work at and um just being able to pull out more issues from yeah. the question prompt okay okay um that's great and how about um brent uh, hi my name is brantley carter I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. I went to uh, St. John's University. And um, I guess I'd like to get out of this session, maybe organizing my answer better. And as Sheila touched on answering the call to question as well as the gray areas. Okay. Um, back to Idaho, um, Fran. Hi, hello, my name is Franchelle McClendon. Um, I am from Beloit, Wisconsin. So blessed to say this is my second career. And I would like to work on the analysis part of the IRAC. Okay. Um, Monica from Idaho. Hi, my name's Monica. I'm from Southern California. Um, something that I would want to work on is um, analysis slash issue spotting. Okay. Good to know. Um, so let's go then to uh, Jacob. Hi, my name is Jacob. Um, I'm from Texas, went to Texas Tech University. Um, one thing I would want to work on is just um, multiple choice questions. Okay. All right, good to meet you, Jacob. So, um, in Orlandis, are you, are, have you joined us? Um, so back to where we started, Drake, we just have a couple more students. Um, Jasmine. Hi, my name is Jasmine Meikle. I am from Valley Stream, New York. I went to undergrad at SUNY Cortland. Um, I'm a one L at Drake. What I want to get out of this is better study habits. Okay. And um, Ian Day. Uh, again, my name is Ian Day Ashford, and uh, I'm from Saginaw, Michigan. I went to Saginaw Valley State University, which is in Michigan. Um, <clears throat> I guess I would like to get um, out of this an opportunity to write and have it uh, reviewed and, and commented on. I mean, if that's, if that's at all possible. Um, but if not, um, just looking at the IRAC, that's, that's about it. Okay. Good. I think that's everyone. Has anyone not spoken or introduced themselves? I just want to let you know that Orlandis is on the um, conference, but I don't think his audio is working. So maybe that's why you can yeah. Okay. All right. Well, hello, Orlandis, and I'm sorry your audio is not working. Um, and thank you for whoever said that because um, you would have otherwise been marked absent. So um, let, me, let me tell you a little bit about myself. And um, so you know um, kind of what perspective I'm coming from. My, um, my undergrad was in Cleveland at Case Western Reserve University. Um, and then I did, uh, I have a master's in bioethics and I, I really thought I would stay in that field. Um, and then I, I um, ended up going to law school 
and uh, and also was was signed up for a PhD program in bioethics, and I ultimately dropped the PhD program and stopped it. Uh, with law school. I went to the Washington University in St. Louis. Um, after I graduated, I went to um, clerk in Toledo, Ohio, and. Um, and they may be the only person who knows where Toledo, Ohio is. It's from nearby Michigan. Um, and um, that was a good experience. Uh, I definitely encourage all of you, if, if at any point you have time in law school or after, to work with a judge. Um, it's always a good experience. I, went, I ended up going to a large law firm after that. And, uh, and I, I toiled away for six years, and then um, and then and then came to the Department of Justice. And at the Department of Justice, um, I started off in, in the Office of International Affairs, which deals with extraditions and with um, mutual legal assistance with other countries. But then I started um, a, a, kind of like a de detail or secondment to the leadership office at, at the department, um, to the deputy assistant attorney general for, um, for international affairs. And then after that, I started um, most recently as counsel to the assistant attorney general of the criminal division. So that's where I, that's where I currently work. The criminal division has something like 17. Um, and, and we work on prosecuting people some of the most serious crime that the country faces. It's mostly, it's all federal um, criminal actions, um, and we, we team up a lot with U.S. Attorney's Office. So that's kind of my day job. But if I back up and, and, and tell you a little bit more um, below the surface, I, um, I love working with students. I've been, a, I've been teaching as an adjunct, uh, which is a real passion of mine for I think four years or so, maybe more than four years. And at University of District of Columbia, so UGC Law School. And I teach federal courts, um, but I also teach professional responsibility. But one thing that's true about, um, about law school is, is that, and this is in my own experience, um, that your first year is really pivotal because it is basically, and you're all going through this right now. Um, and um, I haven't, you know, I usually teach to, to two L's and three L's. Um, but as one L is basically what's happening to you is it, it's kind of this rite of passage where um, you're being put in the pot and um, basically unlearning in, in some ways the way that you used to think and write. Um, and, and approach an issue and relearning a new one. And, it's, and, and it, it almost feels like an invasive brain surgery. Like someone is, you know, re, is, is disconnecting and reconnecting all the um, wiring in our brains. And a big part of, of that relates to our thinking, but ultimately, um, and um, and I think for purposes of what we're going to do, it's reflected in our writing. Because irrespective of the fact that practicing attorneys may have graduated from one of your law school or a different one, there's something about good legal writing um, that almost any lawyer can pick out. And a lot of good legal writing um, is learned in your first year of law school, where you are now. So, um, so what I really want to focus on with you is, is legal writing and, and research. That said, um, we have extra time. Um, I anticipated and hoped that I would hear more from you about what you'd want out of us. And one thing I didn't anticipate, but now um, I want to think about how to incorporate is, is some time that focuses on, on multiple choice questions. 
my classes that I teach, I always, um, I always use like a essay exam. I don't really do multiple choice, but um, but I'm familiar with it, and the, and and hopefully we'll be able to come to you. Maybe not today, but um, in the future with with a few um, pointers and maybe some some practice problems. Um, I'm excited to be teaching this class to you. And um, it's, it's also, I mean, for me, it's, it's I'm not doing this um, for, for any, you know, the, the main reason why I'm doing this is because I want to see you succeed. Clio is a, is a really fantastic organization, as I hope that you know, and maybe some of you, or all of you, have um, taken other Clio classes or, or trainings. Um, and so I really believe in the mission and I want to uh, see it advance and be a part of it, uh, of its advancement. So, so with that in mind, um, I think we can start unless you have questions. A couple other just caveats. Um, I have no monopoly on, on knowledge or wisdom or the way of doing things. And if at any point, you have to determine between going with what I said, with what I suggested during these sessions, or with what your professor says that he or she wants you to do. Always go with your professor. Um, I'm not here to, to take the place of your professor. I'm here to try to help you think about legal writing, think about how to improve your grades, um, um, through, through good exam taking. Um, and and there, there is uniformity in that to a certain extent. But one thing that's true about law school, and I think, you know, by now you've, you've noticed this, it's that you, when you take property law, contrary to what you may have thought before law school, and maybe contrary to what your friends and family may think, we're not lawyers, you in property law do not learn all of property law. You don't walk out of that class being able to practice property law at any time for any client. You leave that class with some slice of the pie of the substantive knowledge um, of property law. And one professor's viewpoint on, on various issues of property law that he or she decided to focus on. So you, you take, you know, my students who, for example, take my constitutional law class, I think it would be more accurate to say that they're taking Professor Corpor's con law class as opposed to they're taking constitutional law. <clears throat> the, the role that your professor plays is so key and it's, it's su such a um, pivotal aspect of any class that I highly encourage you to, to be much more focused on what the professor is saying in class than what any horn book says or what, um, or what other outlines say, or what, even what the textbook says. Because at the end of the day, when you take an exam, you are taking an exam that is written by a particular professor, will be graded by a particular professor, and only you and your classmates will have had the opportunity to have spent hours and hours of class time with this professor. So if that class time is not reflected in your exam answer, then you, you may be doing something wrong. Unless you've been instructed to kind of disregard what's happening in class, which, is, which would be very unlikely. Um, it is always wise to follow what your professor wants. And you are all adults in graduate school now. This is not, you know, this is, this is for real stuff. Um, so whether or not your, your professors would all agree, 
none of them have a monopoly on wisdom or knowledge either. And none of them know everything. What they're doing is they're developing a curriculum, a slice of the pie of the subject matter that they're teaching to you. Um, and they're trying to challenge you to think about it. They're trying to see if you were able to read and synthesize information on your own and then come to class with the ability to um, with the ability to use the information that you learned um, or re redefine it. And, and, um, and a lot of times that is the legal process. It is refinement. Of, of knowledge that you acquire uh, kind of slowly and that becomes more customized depending on what you need the information for. So as you may have, may, as you could have told maybe from, your, from some of the writing assignments you've already had, um, good legal writing is mostly good editing and going over things over and over again and rewriting them and rethinking them and restructuring them so that at the end of the day, you provided um, the best structured and written um, uh, argument or, or piece of writing um, that, that you can. So, so that was a little bit of a diver uh, divergence, but, but that might happen often. And I'm just, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to you as though you're all kind of my, um, my brothers and sisters who, who are about to start law school, and I'm kind of a, the older brother who's been through it. And I'm gonna give you my, my, my tips of the trade: what worked for me, what worked for others who I know, and what didn't work at all. Um, so, so that's not the, again another caveat. Don't assume that everything I say is, um, is right, but also don't assume it's wrong. If you disagree with me immediately, at least hear me out and, um, and, and you know, use your own mind to come to what the best conclusion is for you. Um, also, there are 15 of us, 15 of you, one of me, um, in this, in, during these sessions. If you have information or you have thoughts that will benefit your colleagues who are on this, please jump in. You know, I want us to, I want this to be one long conversation. So, um, and, and share what your, what your views are, what's worked for you, what hasn't worked for you, uh, what you struggle with, what, you know, what you don't, and, and, and don't be afraid to learn from one another. Um, does anyone have any questions? Comments? Okay. So, one thing I wanna talk about with you, and this is, um, this is important now and today. It is, um, it's not something that we're going to focus on in this course at all. It is uh, notating. And how to ultimately kind of take your notes and turn them into something useful. So right now you guys are, are going to class almost every day. And um, and you're, you, you, you're, sitting, you're sitting through these lectures. So I think, do any of you handwrite notes or is everyone using a computer? Any handwrite? I mean, I assume most of you use computers. Does, that, does anyone do uh, handwritten? I handwrite. I handwrite my notes. I handwrite and use the computer. Okay, so there so, so there's there are actually more handwriters than I thought. Um, my view on note taking is that you want to write down as much as you can of what the professor is saying. Okay, during class. 
And the reason I say this is because a lot of times you know what the what the intention of the professor is. Um, I hope somebody, if, you, if you're not talking, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can someone mute their phone? I can hear music in the background. Okay, I think it's muted now. Um, okay, so note taking. We really, you really want to get as much information as you can from your professor. And um, your professor typically is not going to hand you his or her notes. Um, they're going to expect you to come to class ready to, to take your own. So I'm sure that you've already gotten all kinds of advice on note taking. My advice is really simple. It's just write down almost everything your professor says. And the way that I used to do it um, in law school that worked for me was I would come in with the notes that I took of the reading. And they would be kind of in, in the first part of my notes. And, um, and then I would have right, right, I would have like a dotted line right under that. I would write everything my professor said almost. And then after class, um, you know, it might not be right after class, it might be um, an hour or two later, but as soon as possible afterwards. I would spend only 10 minutes um, just going through those notes, reading them over, and then deleting stuff that really didn't matter. Um, or, or editing them so that they make more sense. And, um, and, if, and sometimes, like, if I took, like, let's say class on day three, we learned something, and, and, and I know that on day one, you know, something was said that is no longer relevant or whatever, I, could, I might even go back to class one and, and make those changes. So then by the end of the semester, what I have is – is two, what, what I'm about to outline, I have two major tranches of information. The first is the notes I took of the reading, and the second is um, the notes from class. And what I do is I take both of that, both of those tranches, and I have a third document or a third thing, and that's the outline. And, and I really riff off mostly the um, what was said in class and, and try to make that really the core of what I care about. And now having been a professor now for four years or so, I find that the students who demonstrate in their exam answers that they've actually been in class, they've shown up for class um, and listened and gotten something out of it, it really does show in their exam answers. Um, because, you know, the book is going to focus on all kinds of different things, whereas the material that's discussed in class, the points that are made in class, the hypos that the professor may provide during class um, are, are, are the kind of things that you really have to show up and take notes and think about. Now, another thing I'm note taking is when your professor gives you a hypo, like, you know, when you have a, you know, you go through a case all together in class or something. And then from that case, your professor will start saying, okay, what if this happened with a slightly different fact? How does that change things? And generally, the reason a professor does that is because they want you to think about, you know, how can the case that we just read be applicable to a new set of facts? And the ability to make that determination, that is what analysis is. Analysis taking a new set of facts, new information, and being able to apply the law and previous understandings to that new set of information. So when your professor gives you a hypo in class, I would almost always write those down because you're getting some insight into the professor's thinking pattern. And, and if your professor is saying a hypo during class, can you imagine when your professor sits down to write his or her exam, 
it's the same thing. They're trying to think about a hypothetical situation that relates to the class material so that you can, you know, give an answer to it. So there is some chance that something very similar to a hypo that the professor gave in class may show up in some form in the exam. So, um, so I'm a, you know, especially when your professor starts talking about hypos, write that stuff down. And in my view, in my personal view, I would write down literally as much as you can of what the professor says, and then only afterwards refine it. Now, if you're taking handwritten notes, it's a little bit difficult to try to write everything, to keep up with everything. So, um, so you want to be, you, in that context, it's helpful because you have to be more attentive during class. Um, but if you stop writing during class, if you stop taking notes, think about, really think about during those pauses, if, if something is being said that you shouldn't be writing down. Because you don't want, you know, um, you don't want to miss something. Um, that's important just because you don't have the time to, to jot it down. And if you're taking compute, if you're taking, you know, don't be afraid to change strategies either. So if, if you're taking uh, handwritten notes, um, but you think that maybe computer notes will be better off for you, don't say to yourself, well, I started this semester doing handwritten notes, so I'm not going to switch to a computer because I've already committed to this. I would say you still have an opportunity to, to really, you know, get, a, get more information, more helpful information for the rest of the semester if you make a change. And the same way goes the other way. So if you're taking computer notes and you think to yourself, well, I'm writing too much, I'm not, I'm not as fast as typing as I am writing or whatever reason, um, then don't be afraid to to, to put down, the, uh, or if you're being distracted, if you are getting on like social media and G-chat and stuff during class, huge mistake, huge mistake, because, and the person who, who is worse off for it is you. Um, if, it, if you need to send a quick message or a quick email or something that takes literally 10 seconds or less, fine, you know, you know, that's, that, that can be understandable. But if it is like a superfluous and um, unnecessary social conversation, just stop doing it. Get your, we're like kind of humans are creatures of habit. So just stop, just stop doing it, cold turkey, um, and, and never go back to it. Because number one, a lot of resources is being dependent on you being in law school. Some of you may be on scholarships, but some of you are not on scholarships, I assume. Um, don't squander that, those resources, whoever's paying them, on, um, on Gchat or on the messaging. The other thing is, there, you will have better social conversations if you are not in the middle of looking on this. And those of you in chat are probably thinking to yourselves, like, okay, man, stop talking about, about instant messaging. But it is like an epidemic. Um, it, it, am I wrong? Is there, do you guys notice that there's students in class who chat during class? And, and what do you, does anyone have any thoughts on that, an opinion on that? It's annoying. I see it all I see it all the time. I sit way in the back. So I see everybody's computer screens. I sit in the front so I don't notice it. Same. I'm I like to sit in the front. That way I eliminate any types of distractions. Yeah, I'm like Laura. I sit in the front of the classroom, so it doesn't distract me because when I used to sit like in the second or third row, it's just very distracting. Even with people who are on their computers and using it for other purposes, it's just really distracting, distracting for me. 
Okay, good. Well, here, here's what I, here's how I want you to think about it now. Don't be distracted by it. Anytime you see somebody else using their computer for some unnecessary purpose during class, pat yourself on the back and say, that's great for me because that's one student who I know I can, you know, beat out in the exam. Because if they're, if they're not paying attention, um, then they're losing out. And the more students who do it, frankly, the better it is for you in the competitive world. But in the world of, you know, wanting to post um, out of what you're doing, it just does not make sense. Don't, please, if you're doing it, please just stop. Um, and, and for some of you, you could just not come to any more of these sessions and that advice alone may, may cause you to boost your grades if, if, if it was like an issue for you. Um, but, I, but I hope you'll stay on. So, so, um, so that's that on note taking. I'd like to hear any of your, your thoughts on note taking or questions on note taking. I don't want to focus too much about it because, um, because it's really not the core of our, our class. In many ways, what I'm going to do is assume that you have the notes that you have. They may be great and they may not be great, but you need to get a good, um, uh, um, you need to get a good grade in the class. So, but before we move on from note taking, does anybody have any suggestions, thoughts, questions? I have a question. So I recently started note taking, like writing down everything the professor says in class and immediately after class typing it up. But what I realized is that sometimes I'm typing up like three or four pages and have difficulties like trying to condense it down. That's a, that's a great question. Um, it's a very, very good question because you have to condense it. You cannot reasonably be able to take everything that's said and use it. And, and there's also gonna be a fair amount of repetition. By the way, I wouldn't necessarily write a lot of what your classmates are saying, unless the professor is like, yes, that's exactly right. Because, um, because what your classmates say and what you say, you know, you, this is the first time you're taking this class, you're not an expert in it, it's the professor who's the expert. So, um, so you wanna focus on what the professor is saying. Now, in terms of cutting it down, um, first of all, repetitive stuff you can get rid of. Because your professor is going to say what the rule of law is a few times. Um, um, you know, you can get rid of it if you wrote it many times. Um, facts of a case, you know, you, you might, the professor may be calling on someone and getting that out and, and it comes out um, slowly and in pieces. So you can condense that and, and only, only include the, the, the important facts. Um, don't, don't include stuff that's not necessary at the end of the day. And also, it's not so bad to have a lot of notes from your professor, so long as when you do your outline, which is the tool that they use, for exam prep is not excessive. Because at the end of the day, what you should be able to do with your outline is you should be able to say, okay, this is it. I'm taking my class notes and I'm throwing them out. I'm taking my notes on the book and the reading and stuff and I'm throwing them out. All I need is this outline. And if you have put it together yourself, the outline, then the, the information that you synthesize from other sources is all somewhere in your head um, and if you need to go back to your notes, you can kind of be able to do that. So I don't want to, my purpose is not to create for you um, unnecessary work or to have too much that it's not actually useful. But what I don't want to happen, the biggest fear that I have for you is that the professor says something that's really important or really helpful or really key, and you don't have any record of, of what was said. That's what I want to avoid. And that's what I try to, so again, and this is something that worked for me and it may not work for you, but the, the, the way that I attack this situation is by trying to take down as much as I can about what the professor's saying, of course, with the exception of stuff that's obviously not important. 
um, which, you know, a lot of that is going to, a lot of, you know, at least 25% of what the professor says is, is not really note-taking um, material, but, you know, the substance of the law, the substance of the facts, the substance of the analysis, the hypos, um, the kind of conclusions that are drawn, all, all of that stuff, I think is valuable and ought to be. The, the, the one difficulty is that after class, you have a lot of uh, class because it's fresh. But by the end of the semester, you have, you you're you're put in a position where you have to try to remember information from from ten from dozens and dozens of classes. And it's, it's very difficult. So if you have a record of all the important stuff that happened during that class, reading through it in prep, uh, as you prepare for your outline is, is, um, is invaluable. Any other? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Does somebody Does have a question? question? Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, I my professor tends to like to use the PowerPoints to put his notes up there for both property and crim law. Um, yeah. So what, sometimes I may miss it on the PowerPoint, but um, what I guess sometimes what I do is I go back and I download the notes when he posts it on Twin. So. Does, I, he, give, does he give you notes? Um, does he give you the notes before the class or after? After. Okay. Are his slides numbered? Yes, they are. And and when they're up on the screen, are they numbered? Or can you like, you can probably see the title? You just see the title of it. Are you sure that he's going to distribute them to you? No, he puts them online after the class. Right, but he never, like, it's every class. He's never like, you know, I don't want to give you this class or that class. No. Okay. So I had a professor like that, too. And, and, and I think the best way to do it in those circumstances is don't, I wouldn't really waste your time writing what's on the PowerPoint slide. What I would do is, um, is basically have your notes be like, numbered out one two three four or if you don't have the slide numbers use the title of the slide and take your notes um take your notes on each slide you know what i mean that's the stuff that's not written in the slide itself and then when you get the slide take the information from it copy out all the text put it in your notes and then incorporate the notes that you took during class on each slide. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I guess so. I, I, I see what you're talking about now, yeah. Because the problem is if, you, if you're getting the professor's slides, there's no real reason to try to write down during class what is already written on the slide. But there's going to be a lot of information that is not on the slide that your professor talks about, um, and you, you don't want to lose that. Okay. Any other like specific situations or concerns or frustrations about note taking? Okay. One thing that frustrated me sometimes with note taking was that because of the Socratic method, because of the nature of the Socratic method, um, sometimes the professor would give like a little bit of information in one class, 
um, and, and say the rule. And then in the next class, you know, we've learned the case that overturned that rule or that made it unnecessary or something. <clears throat> and so the difficulty was, what do I do with my notes from the previous class? Um, are they important? Um, you know, do I even need to take them if this is all gonna change anyways? And what I think at the end that was very helpful to me was because I had good notes in my classes, I was able to, when I found out what the ultimate rule was, I was able to kind of um, follow the professor's reasoning up until we got to that rule because I had good notes. Um, and that allowed me to more, to, to more I think, um, precisely crystallize what the professor was getting at by the end of the particular subject or issue that, that we were studying. So taking notes of what your professor is saying is never really a futile exercise. I think it's always helpful because even if down the road, the, um, what you learn about today is maybe not going to be as important, it will help you to understand the material. And actually understanding the material is pretty important, as you know. Um, the other thing is that, like, so let's take, for example, um, property law, where, you know, sometimes the definition of knowledge differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction or in torts where there's like a majority of jurisdiction rule and a minority of jurisdiction rule. Are you guys familiar with cases like that? Yes. Okay. So when it comes to an exam, the difference between a B answer and an A answer sometimes is being able to say um, is, is being able to identify that the facts that were provided to you would lead to one result in the majority jurisdiction, but would lead to a different result in the minority jurisdiction. And a lot of students may just remember one rule in the way, you know, the, the last way that the professor explains the majority rule. But what the professor might be looking for and hoping for is that a student is able to identify that certain that that because of the facts that were provided um, in a hypo or something, um, the 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 results would be different um, under two different standards of law. And we're going to talk about more about how to answer that kind of question as we get closer um, um, as when we get to other sessions. But for now, um, just recognize that note taking is very important. Recognize and um, that recognize that using your computer for non-class related purposes is is not smart. Um, and and try your best to be attentive in class and to. Um, to write down what you can about what your professor is saying. And when it's a hypo, think of me. And remember, Professor Corpor always said to, uh, to take notes of the hypos that the professor gives. And if you end up getting an exam question that's a variation of a hypo that was given in class, then you owe me a beer. I have a question for you. Go ahead. Yeah, so how did, how did you balance uh, like taking copious notes, like staying on top of the notes? Like you said, you wanted to take everything that the professor was saying down, but at the same time being engaged and like understanding like what's being said, right? Because they're like two different tasks, right? Like understanding what's being said versus just getting it down, right? Depending on like the pace at which the professor's moving, like that can be difficult to stay with both. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a very, very good question. And it was never, um, I, I, I don't have a good answer for you because sometimes when the professor was talking, 
I understood what he or she was saying and I was taking good notes on it. But a lot of times, and, and to be honest, to be totally honest, maybe more times than, I, than, than should be the case, I had no clue what the professor was talking about. But because I took really good notes of what he or she said, when it came down to doing the outline, and when it came down to reviewing the notes, it gave me the opportunity to understand, to at least understand um, later what the professor was talking about. And I can't tell you, I mean, it's basically my routine through a semester to basically have no idea what, what a lot of what my professor was saying during class. But then by the time I was outlining and going through the material on my own in the library, you know, um, then that's the point at which I really learned one. So what I want to do actually with you now is um, I can share my screen with this thing, it looks like. So I want to share my screen um, and show you what my, what my folders for a class used to look like, or I still have them. So um, let me see. You guys know how to share screen. I'm, I'm clicking share screen, but it's not. You see my screen? No. No, we don't see it. No. How about now? Oh, um, yeah. Yes. Okay. This is kind of creepy. <laughs> okay. You see my screen now, right? Yes. So let's, let's look at, um, like, I have my 2L folder here. And then fall semester. So um, I took, let's see, evidence. Okay. So here's, here's what I'm talking about. So here, this is, this is the class, and this is what my notes look like before, uh, before I outline. So here I have um, like class one and two, casebook here, and then I have basically my notes on, on a class. And they're, they're not italicized, okay? And then right, under, right underneath, I have the date of the class, and then <coughs> I have my professor's notes, or like what my professor said during class in italics, okay? And you keep going and it goes, like basically notes that I took of, of, uh, from the book, and then, and then here, like look, yesterday's hypo. And I'm talking now about like, and, and then this italics part, I have what the professor um, said during class. And it just keeps going back and forth and back and forth. Okay. And you can do that in other forms. There's all kinds of cool note taking um, programs nowadays. And eventually look what I've got here. This is my outline. It is, um, you know, it's short, it's to the point. It's, um, and what I did is I, the way, the way I make my outline, is I'll take um, I'll take the uh, this stuff, right? And the way I the way obviously you structure this, you should know this by now, is you gotta you gotta get the syllabus and and basically take the syllabus and make that the structure of what the outline ultimately looks like. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that. Um, it means that the, uh, the, 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 the framework of the outline, the, um, you know, the, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the, the topics, the order, all that stuff follows the syllabus. Okay. And then what you can do is you go like, like this day one, I read this and I read this, but I focus more on what the professor said. And so when I do here, I put in the important stuff. 
And of course, you know, I'm not, you know, no one is perfect and writes everything or knows everything that they're talking about. So I'm also on the side, I'm looking at horn books, I'm reading other students' um, uh, outlines in areas that I don't, you know, that I don't totally get. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking at other sources, but my primary source is this italicized stuff because it's what the professor said during class. And as you can see, like this looks like notes that I wrote down real quick during class, but then afterwards, you know, kind of organized and cleaned up. Not, not incredibly well, like they don't look amazing, but they're at least readable. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then here for the outline, you've got, you need a tool that's actually helpful, right? So, um, so here I'm looking at relevance. First is the definition, so that's the main rule. <clears throat> and then I've got what the judge has to think about. And there's all these, um, they're numbered out. And then I have the example. This was a helpful example that the professor used in class and then a case that's on point. Um, you know, if someone else picked up this outline, they may not find this helpful, but this is what was helpful to me. And that's why another thing is, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about outlining uh, in more detail, but you got to make your own outline. It's key to make your own outline. And now I got to get you out of my computer somehow. How do I do this? Stop share. I'm just texting. Okay, you can't see my screen anymore, can you? Can you guys see my screen anymore? Nope. No. It um, So there are two things I want to do with you today. Um, the first is I want to talk about schedules and the importance of making a schedule. And then the second thing I want to do is do overall writing tips. Okay. And then by the end of our session today, I want to hear from you what your writing classes are going to require from you in coming weeks so that in the next course, I can orient some of my remarks to, um, to that. So, um, so let's start by, and by the way, I want to create for you minimum work that you have to do between our sessions, because I know you have enough work to do. But I may, my, I may ask you to read a case or two that are short, um, uh, just so that we have something to talk about, frankly. And if you're not able to read it, don't worry, I'll probably summarize it for you. I don't want to create too much work for you. I want this to just be beneficial to you, um, not be a burden to you. So, um, so with that in mind, let's talk about a schedule. Um, it is uh, uh, extremely important to be aware of how about um, a couple of things when it comes to making your schedule. The first is you want to know how much your classes count for. So if you have a two credit class and you have a four credit class, you should not spend nearly as much time um, on your two credit class as your four credit class. And in fact, excuse me one second. In fact, you should probably be spending half of the time, um, if possible, on your two credit class. Because your GPA is weighted, um, and, and you want to be cognizant of that. The other thing you want to keep in mind is how well have you mastered a particular subject on a macro level? Am I good at torts? Am I good at property? You want to have that perspective um, and be honest with yourself because just because you think you're good at something, it doesn't necessarily mean you are. And just because you think you're bad at something doesn't necessarily mean you are. So try to be, you know, try to do measurable guides to determining whether or not you're good at something 
And a good way to, to, to have that is to say, okay, when the professor's talking in this class, is any of it a surprise to me? Or did I really know it just from the readings and from you know, my own knowledge? So you have to have your assessment of how well you know a class. And then from there, um, you've got to uh, set a schedule for two things, okay? At a minimum, outlining and exam studying. I used to also, and it's helpful, uh, it was helpful to me, I used to also um, do a schedule that showed when I would do my readings for certain classes. And that's a little bit neurotic and maybe too far to actually have it in writing because maybe it's already in your head, you know. But, um, but let me go through here and show you what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna share my screen again. All right, can you see it? Good. Actually, I'm gonna do it in, in my Google. You guys mostly use Google for your calendar or something else? Yes. Okay. If you don't have a calendar, get a calendar. And online calendars are great, but you know if you hand, if you have one that's that's um, a handwritten one, that's fine too. So I'm going to pretend that this is um, um, like the beginning of your exam week, okay? So first of all, you know, we're always know if there's something going on here. So let's say here. This is Veterans Day, so let's assume that I, you don't have class on Friday. And let's assume the, you, know, you need to prepare for your um, outline. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna look at your schedule, as, assuming you have you know, um, a few classes that are scattered in time. This is, this is probably how your, your calendar looks to show like when you're busy with classes. And it might be in the evening or whenever, but I just want to put some class on here. So now what you need to do is look at the gaps and give yourself enough time to read and prepare for class. But let's say here, outlining does take, it requires you to have like at least an hour, I think, and, and, and hopefully at least a couple hours um, where you're outlining. So then, so then have your class schedule next to you. Basically, okay, I have um, five classes that I have to, or no, four classes I have to outline for because legal writing you don't outline for. So here you can say um, outline um, class one, okay? And on the same night, let's say you'll take a break, you give yourself like a half hour break. Um, break and then here you're going to outline again for class two. Now I'm assuming that these are kind of like equally weighted, which what, what eventually your calendar should look like as a first year law student is this is going to be just covered. You're not going to have any time to do anything. Okay. Because law school requires uh, one out year requires that level of detail. Um, but that is, I mean, the importance of setting a, a, a schedule and sticking to it is so key because, um, because you will lose sight if you say, well, I'm just going to figure things out on my own. You will lose sight and, and uh, get stuck on something and not have time to do other outlines. Did any of you have um, um, challenges when it came to scheduling that, that prevented you from, from, um, from preparing adequately? Yes. Tell me about that. That was really um, tough because 
Um, I know with me, I'm one that likes to do everything task by task, but I had to change that around. And the one thing that we, um, that I was told here at the ASP center here in Vermont was to implement the two day buffer rule to get your readings done instead of crunching it, all of my readings for that next day in one night, um, I would have to give myself two days for each class. So that way, if something happens, I will have already completed the reading before, instead of having to crunch it the night before. If you can do a two day buffer before you, for your readings, that's, that's a good idea. But, um, you know, if you don't be afraid that if, okay, well, I only have one day left, so I'm just not going to do the reading. Try to still get to it, and um, and when you do the reading for a class and prep for class. And by the way, everything I'm telling you when it comes to um, scheduling and reading and note taking, all of it is because these are all elements that result in um, measurable differences in your exam grade. If you have good notes. If you have a good schedule that you stick with, then you have a high likelihood of creating a good outline and studying well. And as a result, um, performing as well as you can in the exam. So, so these are preliminary elements and we, we've, got to, we've got to discuss them because, um, <clears throat> because, of, because they will uh, make a difference on the exam. When it comes to scheduling, you have to recognize that you're going to need a break sometimes. And, and of course, as you get closer to the exam, you need less breaks or you, not you need, but you, you permit yourself less breaks. Um, think about also whether it's been helpful to study in groups or on your own or mostly on your own, but then somewhat with one partner or something. My, what I did in law school was I, you know, I'm, I'm more of a loner when it comes to studying. And so I would do everything on my own, but then I had this one friend and she was just so smart, so much smarter than me. And, uh, but I would try to keep pace with her. And, um, and at the end of the, at the end of our studying for a class, we would get together, we would kind of compare, we would go issue by issue and say, what is your rule statement for this? What is your rule statement for that? Um, you know, you did this practice exam, how did you, you know, what did you, what was your analysis on this or that and what cases were relevant? Um, because it, you're going to have to learn the basics on your own and you, you want to, um, um, to, you know, sometimes in a group setting, if one person gets it, then the rest of the group may go on. And, and, and that's good for the person who knows it, but for the people who don't know it, you know, you could be kind of stuck, at, you can be out of luck because you need to know that in order for the cumulative knowledge to build. So if you're gonna be in a group setting, prepare for that group study session. You know, ha have your, you know, make sure that you've done your reading. Don't rely on the fact that you'll learn stuff from other people when you get to the group session. Be the person who's teaching others because if you say one, if you say it, um, if you say what a rule is or what your understanding of a case is, uh, another, another person may come and say, no, that's not right. It's, it's actually this. Then you can see, you can come to it, you know, you can at least explore the issue and see who's right and who's not. Um, so so it, all of it takes effort and discipline. And, um, and so the other part of group versus individual study is that you have to budget it within your schedule because just because you're going to study for property with three or four people does not mean that you don't give time to yourself by yourself to study the same information. Because um, again, uh, group settings are imperfect. There's good things about them because you're kind of encouraging each other. It's social. It's, you know, it keeps your brain kind of uh, functioning for a longer period maybe. Uh, but I, but I'd like to hear from you guys. Are there any challenges about um, 
about the format, like group versus individual or, or some variation between those two that you have questions or that you want to share ideas about? I guess I have a question. Okay. Okay, so my question was, I know that you said when you were with your friend, you typically went over terms regarding um, rule statements. So how would you go over, I mean, with someone else? Okay, good question. So you said that I, when I explained how I studied, it was like I made my own outline and did it myself kind of, then got together with, with one other person and, and we, we discussed issues? Yes. Okay. So first of all, we only, the, uh, you're asking about my experience again and, 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 and other very intelligent people um, have done very well and, and did it differently than I did. but. Um, but, but the way that I would do it is, and, and we would do it together, is kind of create our own outlines, um, understand the course material as well as we do, and then get together and only discuss the things that either of us had problems with. So like if I didn't understand why the professor said something or how you know, some rule of law works, um, then I would say, look, I, you know, what are your, what, what do you think about this? Like, what are your, what's your outline on this issue? And then her response would be like, well, here's, you know, here's what I put together on it. And so it would only, we'd only leave the problematic things for discussion because some of the stuff we both just knew, but if either of us had problems, then we discuss it. The other thing that we did is we would take the professor's practice exams and, um, and we, would, we would take those together. So after, you know, so we would go through our outline and determine what, what could be improved. And then we'd sit down um, and time each other and be like in an exam mode and take the exa a practice exam. One thing that I did, and I, I don't know if this is a good thing or not, but I did not actually do much with the practice exams of professor gave them out until after I was done with my outline and done with studying and I had like a couple days before the exam because that's when I use the exam to say, okay, let's say that this is the exam. I read it over, I do it, you know, I respond to it and think, okay, look, um, I understand this, I don't understand that, it allows you to refine things. Um, I don't get it, sometimes I did read the exam the exam prep questions in advance, but, but not always. Um, any other questions? Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, for those of you who study in a group, what has worked for you in a, in a group studying uh, setting? Um, I, I think some of the things that, that you mentioned work kind of, um, you have a different energy about studying when you're putting your head together with others. It's, it's social. Um, you get a chance to fill some, some of the conceptual gaps that your, your classmates have covered, um, by bouncing, like bouncing ideas back and forth. And, uh, it, it's, it's a different field to studying along versus studying, but a lot of times you can lose time and they're not as focused and, you know, those are some of the cons to, um, to studying or group study. So, so, um, and uh, what, what would, what do you, what would you say, um, was, was a way that you could, um, kind of deal with the challenges that came with group study? So I think, uh, most importantly, like if, if you're, 
go to do group study, uh, schedule it out um, with the, the people that you're going to do it with out in advance and have a goal in like, you know, what we're going to study, like what are the parts of the, the material that we're going to focus on. Um, maybe like you said, like a, a particular problem or subject, you know, hit this subject hard and we're going to do that rather than having this broad idea of what we're going to come together and do. Because once you get there, you're trying to work those details out. You kind of have the details taken care of before actually coming together versus figuring out once you're there. Okay. And does any, did anybody kind of was more of a loner when it came to studying? So you guys are all group studiers. Nobody studied on their own? So last semester, I studied like by myself for the most part. And I think it hurt me like in one of my classes because in that class, I studied by my questions. So it's like, I really wasn't even bouncing ideas off of anyone or even talking to the professor. So I found that Hello? very, like, harmful. Can anyone hear the host? I can't hear the host. I think his stuff is frozen. I can't either. I can't either. Yeah, I can't hear it either. He's gone. Yeah, his screen is completely gone. Hello? Yeah, you cut out there for a second. Yeah, I cut out. So somebody was talking about how studying on her own was uh, was ultimately not a, not a good thing for her. Can you can you talk more about that for for our benefit? Okay, so last semester, I mean, I studied um, in one class in particular by myself. Um, it was the last final that I took, and I never really spoke to the professor either. So I spent most of the time studying by myself in that class, and then I spent most of my time um, not talking to the professor and didn't bounce ideas off of her, so not talking to other students for that class. And that was the class that I did the worst in. So I found it to be very harmful, um, just like – not interacting with the professor, but also not interacting with other students in a particular class. Okay. You know, and that, that brings, that, that, that makes it another point uh, for me that I would suggest, which is um, not all classes are the same. So in one class where maybe it makes sense for you to study on your own, in another class, maybe it makes, maybe it's better for you to study with a group. Uh, but just know yourself and what works for you. And I think, Burnett, that's uh, it's good that you take, it's good that you kind of take note of that to so you know not to let that happen next semester. Um, nonetheless, and I think that um, Ayanda, Ayanda, um, what you said is right, which is which is that in group in group studying it is it is particularly important 
it created pleasurable skill. Uh, I think some pretty, uh, I, it's hard to hear because um, if you're not talking, just mute it. Can can you get can whoever's if you're not talking can you hit me please? She might be on her cell phone, like not in front of her computer. Okay. Can can you guys hear me okay now? I hope so. Um, okay. And um, and so so having a good schedule is key. When I talk about a good schedule, I want you to try to do it the way that I when I shared my screen. Get your calendar out. Um, actually put in the time slots where you're going to work on a, on a particular class. Be cognizant of what you're good at and not good at. Um, and be honest with yourself about that. And another thing about the schedule is stick to it to the extent possible. Because even if you might mess up on a half hour here or there, um, you need to stick to it because it's easy to get stuck on an issue. Right. So let's say you 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 went through property law, but you really don't understand, you know, one one issue that you discuss. You can certainly pull out all the horn books and read all about it and 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 eventually understand it. But if it's going to take you so much time that you're not going to be able to get to your other classes and to study for other classes, then just let that issue go. Make a note to yourself to go back to it when you have time, or even to use one of your breaks to go back to that issue. But don't let your desire to be a perfectionist in one class ruin your ability to have a strong understanding in your other classes. Um, it, that's, that's one thing that really happened to me, and that was unfortunate, is that sometimes I might get stuck up on one little issue in one class, and it will cause it would have caused me to kind of mess up uh, my schedule, and um, and that would mean getting less sleep. It would mean learning less in another class. Another thing about your schedule that's important is um, if exercise is important to you, don't stop exercising. You know, see if even if it's like a fifteen minute run or something, continue to to put that in if you can. Maybe it has to stop as you get um, within a couple of weeks of exams or something, but, um, but give yourself that, that short time. But think about how to reduce um, um, the time that's required to, for example, like if you go to a gym, but you can instead go to your building, just go to your building even if it's a worse gym because it, it will give you another hour. Um, if there, if there are little things that you can do, um, rather than say, oh, well, I have to go to the gym and it's gonna take extra time, so it's fine, I just won't study property tonight. I would say, don't do that. Instead, like get out a P90X video and do your exercise right at home um, instead of going to the gym because that way you could, you're able to do both. So be creative and be um, persistent about making sure that you're giving yourself enough time for your classwork. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to family and friends and stuff, since you're a 1L, um, your family and friends may not be used to your, your disappearing. So um, if you can, look, there are different life situations and sometimes it's just not possible. But if, if it's possible, then just, just tell the, the people you love around 
around you. Um, the best way you can support me right now is to wish me the best and know that, you know, us not talking for the next month or two weeks or whatever it is, is, is only because I really need to improve my uh, grades to do well in this, in this time. And as soon as it's over, we'll go celebrate together and have a good time. But, um, but certainly don't uh, uh, force yourself to engage in like unnecessary social activity um, during the exam time or, or during time where you're, you should be outlining or following your schedule. Stick to your schedule, study hard, work hard. It's temporary. And as soon as the exams are over, you, you can go back to being a normal person in the world. Um, but for now, really, you know, think about how you can put your, you can set your schedule in a way that's going to, um, that's going to maximize your uh, studying and your ability to do, to do well. So, um, uh, and I don't mean to be insensitive, by the way, so just let me asterisk all that with, if you have a certain life situation that requires your, um, that requires that you be kind of with family or friends for something, you know, I, I certainly don't want to uh, interfere with your judgment calls on that. But if it's, you know, a social activity that, that, that could, could or could not happen and it could go either way, then I would say hey, this year is your one out year prioritize study. Um, so, so that's that. Um, let's now, I want to give you some, um, I want to give you an opportunity now to ask any questions or, um, or, or if, if anything I've said so far has kind of triggered a thought or something, I, I would like for you to share it now because um, I'm going to go through and I, I have to um, um, do this because writing is so important and there are some things that regardless of what you're writing are true. So I wanna go through some general writing tips for you that are gonna be important no matter what the, what the thing is that you're writing, whether it's a brief or a memo or an exam question or anything. Um, I wanna focus on some general writing tips. But first, please ask questions or share concerns or, or if you disagree with me on something, explain why. Um, I want to give you that opportunity before I kind of lecture for a little bit. How about um, Fran? What do you think? Any thoughts? Um, well, no, I don't have any thoughts. I agree with Burnett, though. Some, um, sometimes when you study by yourself, you don't talk to the professor. It does harm you. Um, okay. Um, that's a good thought, and, and, and how you interact with the professor is, is important. Um, my suggestion on that is don't go to your professor without having a decent understanding of what you're asking about, and make sure that it's a, it's a question that you've researched a little before you go in, because two reasons. One, you want to maximize um, what you learn from your professor during those sessions. And second, because um, you want to show your professor that, that you are focused on the class, you're paying attention, you're taking notes, and that you really have a, a, a question or issue that they, can, that they can help you with. And when they see that, like as a professor, when I see that a student has made an effort before coming to me, then I find myself giving more information and sharing more deep ideas about something than if a student is coming to me with, um, with like a, you know, really basic question that they could have just, you know, I could just flip open the book and say, well, just look at rule 21. Um, so any other thoughts on, um, on all this, how about Nicole from uh, Mitchell? What do you, any, any thoughts from you? Um, I generally disagree with what everyone's saying, so. Well, tell us more. <laughs> okay. Um, 
like what Franchelle said, I think that it is important to go speak to your professors. I know that if I feel like I've, you know, become behind in readings or something like that and I'm confused, I generally just wait until I catch myself up. And then if I'm still confused about, you know, whatever topic, whether it be, I don't know, promissory stop on contracts or something of that nature, I will go and read that section over. And if I'm still kind of questioning myself about what that is, then I'll go meet with my professor and get some clarification. Um, and I know we're all in the same section here at Mitchell. So our professor holds a informal review session that we've been going to. Um, so yeah. that's pretty helpful. And our property professor is pretty open to answering questions as well. Good. That's great. So, but did you say you disagreed with everything or you agreed with them? No, I agree with everything as well. Oh, okay. I thought you yeah. said, no, I disagree with everything that's been said. Oh, no. Okay, good. All right, great. Well, that, that's helpful. Uh, definitely a good point to bring out. Um, if your professors have the review sessions, go. Uh, definitely go. Even if you think you've mastered the subject, I think it's still important to go. Um, how about um, Crystal? Any thoughts from you at Vermont? Yeah, sure. Uh, I kind of agree with everyone. I don't really do study groups. Um, I kind of maybe more or less informally talk to some of my, um, some of the people in my section about uh, some, uh, some of the issues I have with a certain topic that was presented in class. But a lot of the times if, I, if I'm having issues, I'll go to the professor, of course, and then a lot of the times I'll just schedule, like I'll like schedule ahead of time, like a meeting with the ASP, academic success mentor, to kind of go over like in depth, like some of the issues that I have in certain courses. And I found that to be very helpful. So if you're not really one that kind of wants to do like a study group, I would definitely recommend like a mentor um, at ASP to kind of like go over some of the issues in the class. That's worked for me. I've really, I also never just had any like issues not being a part of like a formal study group. Okay, good. Um, how about Brantley? What do you, do you have any thoughts to share? Um, I kind of agree with, with everything that's been said. Um, as for myself, I do study alone and I find that it works for me as long as when I do need clarification on whatever topic or issue or rule statement, I will meet with my professor and I have certain people where I can bounce ideas off of. So as long as I have a balance, there's people that I know that I can run to, I feel comfortable in studying by myself and doing my own thing really. Yeah. It sounds like um, the approach you're taking sounds like the one that I took in law school too. And people, everyone has to do what works for them. Um, but, but I know that, um, um, you know, studying, studying by your, for yourself has to happen, whether you do it in addition, you do it with a group or you're only, you know, going to people to bounce ideas off of. Yeah, I agree. The one thing, yeah, the one thing please avoid is all of you, is if you're a group studier, um, avoid kind of the group culture of, okay, if one person gets in the group, then we'll just move on. You have to understand it. Um, and and if, it, if it's not, if it's at the point at which it's no longer helping you to be in the group, you know, I, I'm going to give advice now that might be a little controversial, but, but I would say just leave because you're in the group so that you can help others and that others can help you. And if you're not getting that kind of um, relationship, it doesn't mean you can't be friends with those people, but it may mean that it's not the right thing for you. And do, if you're, if, even if you have committed to like a technique, whether it's a study technique or a note taking technique, if it's not working for you, don't, continue going with it just because you committed to doing it some time ago. Just change. At the end of the day, what matters is doing well in exams and, and whatever is going to be great at doing well in that work product. And so if you have to modify what you do and how you study or whatever 
in order to get that result, you just have to do it. And, um, um, you know, you are going to be your own lawyer for yourself when you graduate. And so, um, um, so don't be afraid to start thinking that way today. Um, okay, anybody else want to share a thought? I appreciate those who did. Well, I have a question. As a professor, questions that you ask on a routine basis, um, sometimes when you do your reading, I guess what I'm really asking is how do you prepare for class with your reading? Because sometimes you think you know before you go into class, you can anticipate the questions that the professors want to ask, but then you caught like a deer in headlights. Okay, good question. So, so I'm, I'm going to answer that in a couple of ways. Um, the, the, the kind of the straightforward answer to you is the way you prepare is, is you do the readings, you take notes on them, and, um, and you, you, you try to understand it the best you can. Now, in addition to that, you're, it's not a bad idea to, to, to look on the internet of what, other pe of what other folks have said about a certain case even what Wikipedia or someone on Google says about a case may orient you to understand what the important issue is. But be careful of that because sometimes, you know, you only have a piece of a case in your textbook and what's out in the world is more focused on a different aspect of the case. So, um, so I would do the reading. Now, let's say you can't do the reading. Um, you just don't have time to get to it. That sucks. Um, you should you sh you always should try to budget time to do the reading, but don't go into class cold. Um, at least go on like Westlaw, uh, not West. Um, uh, Lexis has good case briefings at the beginning. I think Westlaw probably does too. Go online and read about the cases that that were assigned for that day. At least read the briefs for them so you know what's uh, being discussed. Because when you get to class, you don't want the whole, you don't want the class session to pass you by without, you know, without understanding at least a little bit of what's being discussed, because you'll be worse off for that. So in your class prep, do whatever you can in whatever limited time you have to be ready for that class. When it comes to your professor calling on you, just do your best. Um, Recognize also that the answer is often pretty simple. Don't try to go, don't try to be too complicated about something. Sometimes you like sometimes I find myself asking a student the same question and the answer is like, you know, like something we just discussed literally 10 seconds ago. Uh, but the student feels like, you know, no, this has got to be a tough question because the professor is asking it. So, so don't, don't be afraid of thinking simplistically to some extent. And when I say that, I mean that in almost all of your classes, at least the kind of the, the main um, um, topics like contracts, torts, um, criminal law, property, there's usually um, elements to causes of action. And so you want to think, where am I? What cause of action are we talking about? Negligence and torts? Are we talking about murder and, and criminal? And think, what element are we discussing or what element is this case highlighting? Is it highlighting, you know, whether there's a duty, whether there's not? And when your professor is asking a question or whatever, if you can kind of remember the framework of what the discussion is supposed to be about, then it'll help you in thinking about what the questions are and what your answers are gonna be. But now thinking more broadly and even strategically to some extent about your classroom time. For number one, the whole idea of this like gunners versus non-gunners, this like childish stuff that goes on in law school, don't be a part of it. Don't call people a gunner. Don't not call people a gunner. Just stay away from it. If you have a question in class, ask your question. If you have a, um, if you if 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 you want to answer a question, you think you have a good answer and want to raise your hand, raise your hand. Um, if 
if somebody else is, is doing it, I mean, look, there's a point at which it's kind of annoying and not necessary. If someone is like, doesn't know what they're talking about and they keep chiming in. But if people have something intelligent to say, don't be afraid to say it because 10 years after law school, I'm here and no, I, nobody knew, knows who in my law school was a gunner. Nobody remembers. It doesn't matter. Oh, someone's asking, what is a gunner? A gunner is like uh, the person who like sometimes in, in law school and in other classes, someone is um, always like uh, volunteering in class and asking questions and, and participating. And sometimes in law school, there's ridicule that is associated with being kind of that person or that gunner. But what I'm trying to say is, um, please avoid like thinking about the world in terms of that thing. And just be, um, be yourself, ask questions when you wanna ask questions. Um, um, don't judge other students um, based on what they're saying. Just do your best to use the classroom time to build your own notes, to build your own outline, and ultimately use it for the exam. And if you completely botch a Socratic um, session with your professor in front of the class, don't worry about it because other people are going to botch Socratics, you know, back and forth with their professor. And as long as you give it a try and have a positive attitude, it really doesn't matter. It, it does not matter at all because what does matter is how well you do on things that are graded in that class. Because at the end of the day, you need to distinguish yourself in that way. A couple of points to make while we're talking about it is um, don't like after your exam, after you've taken an exam or after you've taken a midterm or turned in a paper, stop talking about it. When it's no longer in your control as to whether you can affect the outcome of your grade, just let it go. Don't think about it to yourself. Don't talk about it with another student. Don't regret what you did. As soon as it's out, it's out and move on, you have to move on. After all your exams are in and after all your papers are done or whatever, then go ahead and spend whatever time you want thinking about it and wondering whether you answered it correctly or whatever. But don't waste any more time on something that you no longer have control over. It's totally wasteful, okay? All right, any other questions or thoughts or you know, if you disagree with me and want to share your perspective, please do. I don't mind being disagreed with at all. I mean, I think I'm brilliant, but most people don't. Okay. So oh, I just wanted to say that I really appreciated your your um, insight and um, your feedback. I think basically what I took away from what you just said is that we need to all kind of focus on some level of positivity and stay away from neg negativity. And so I really do appreciate that. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, make that known. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. And you're right. Being, you know, being um, a law student, it's easy to be a pessimist. And it's, it's easy to say, oh, we have so much to study for. It was so difficult. And I didn't, you know, I'm nervous about this and I'm paranoid about that. And I'm going to get called on and I'm outlining and all this stuff. In those moments, think about, don't forget to think about the long road, okay? You may be having a lot of challenges and not enough time and difficulties today. But what you're doing is you're setting yourself up for a great career. You're, you're putting yourself in a position where you're going to be able to move the judicial machinery on behalf of others who cannot, on your clients, and you're going to be able to make a difference um, no matter what kind of law you practice. So don't forget the long game here. And remember that 1L is the worst year. It gets better from here. And you only have one more semester. And not only that, but you only have half a, half a semester left. So, um, so be positive. Um, do your best. This is the sprint, you know, the, you should um, at this point in the semester be thinking about starting some of your outlines um, and getting yourself prepared. Okay, so with that, I'm going to um, 
to, to talk to you about a few tips when it comes to writing overall tips. Um, and I'm, I want to uh, give attribution to, um, to Alan Dworsky, who wrote the little book on writing. Um, I, you know, some of the ideas that I'm going to kind of riff off of come from his book called The Little Book on Legal Writing. And, um, and these are, this is for educational purposes, I'm, you know, but I just want to make sure that I'm not taking credit for, um, for coming up with all these ideas on my own. So uh, to begin with, learning legal writing is not like learning a foreign language. It's not totally weird writing. In fact, a lot of times um, when I'm trying to help someone with legal writing, I ask them, what are you trying to say here? And then they say it, and it's actually really good just the way they said it. But, in, but for some reason, when they try to write it, it comes out all weird and jumbled and, and unusual. So think about being simple and being straightforward and, um, and think, think about being crisp and not too uh, legalese. In fact, as you know, legalese is not really, um, um, repeat the name of the book. The name of the book is The Little Book on Legal Writing by Alan Dworsky. Um, so in that sense, you should use familiar and plain words, not uh, complicated verbose words or, or something that's difficult to understand. And, and you should omit words that are not useful. And here's an example. Instead of saying for the purpose of, just say to. Instead of saying in proximity to, say near or close to. Um, you know, instead of saying in the, in the vicinity of, just say near. So you want to get rid of that extra verbiage. You should also kind of, um, as a general tip, avoid redundant phrases. So instead of saying in the area of tort law, just say in tort law. Um, instead of saying emergency situation, just say emergency. You should also avoid needless abstract constructions that use um, using nature, one, process, level. So here's an example. The allegations were serious in nature. Instead, just say the allegations were serious. Or you could, instead of saying litigation is an expensive process, instead just say, Litigation is expensive. Just make the statement. Don't use words that you don't need. Uh, you also, if you can, you want to omit needless introductory words. For example, instead of saying the law is that for a statement to be privileged, it must be true. Instead, say for a statement to be privileged, it must be true. Um, Another example, it would seem difficult that providing fraud will be difficult. Instead, just saying proving fraud would be difficult. I think I said providing and proving. So um, you also want to avoid needless modifiers like very, pretty, somewhat, if you can. So instead of saying like very important, just say important or say critical or say crucial. Um, Instead of saying pretty incredible, just say incredible. Or, um, you know, sometimes you're going to have to use these modifiers, but in general, think about if they're actually useful. Um, active voice uh, is so key. So instead of saying, um, so when, when you're thinking about active voice, what you want to think is to put the noun in front of the verb instead of the verb in front of the noun. So what does that mean? It means that instead of saying that an order was issued by the court, you want to say the court issued an order. 
So um, let me go to um, Brantley. Um, Brantley, I'm going to give you a sentence in the passive voice, and I want you to make it, to turn it into the active voice, okay? So the sentence is this. Um, ice cream was eaten by the boy. Um, the boy ate ice cream? Yes. So let me just put that in the chat. Oh, all right. So now, um, just write down what you said so people have it in writing. Okay. okay how about uh, Jasmine? So I'm going to give you a sentence in the passive voice, and I want you to put it in the active voice, okay? Okay. The decision was made by the judge. The judge made the decision? Yes. Does anybody have any um, problems understanding the difference between passive and active voice? If so, it's okay, because most people in the world actually don't know the difference. So don't be afraid now to say you'd like some clarity. Um, just one thing that I've noted um, about active and passive voice, what's helped me, I noticed that I tend to talk in an active voice when I'm just naturally talking. Right. But sometimes, you know, with writing, you have to kind of go back over it. And I noticed that I still kind of write in a passive voice and have to go back over and change it. So like a thing that's definitely worked for me is basically writing how I talk. And so a lot of the times, like when I'm writing, I kind of forget how it, it would actually sound if I were actually saying it. And so kind of having that mindset actually makes me kind of automatically write in the active voice when I'm doing like a writing assignment. And I noticed that's helped me a lot. That's a very good point. And that's, that's what one of the things I tried to say early on, which is a lot of times um, people, when they're writing, the, you know, they're trying to say something. And if you ask, well, what are you trying to say? When they actually say it, it's clear as day. And it's, it's, you know, simple and clear and active voice. But for some reason, when we go to write it, it's all jumbled and passive and, you know, and, and it could be improved. So I think um, that's a very good comment. And, 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 um, and I'm glad that you're going back and changing your passive sentence into active because the, and, and, and let's talk about why it's important to be in the active voice just for a minute. If you're in the passive voice, a lot of times it's not precise. It's difficult to follow. Um, it might be nice in like a creative essay or something, um, but it, it creates ambiguity sometimes. Because, and, and, and it, it takes more time to understand something. So if I said an order was issued by the court, you kind of, you start with the order was issued and you, you don't know who did the act. So that's why in legal writing, because it's more precise, it seeks to put the, the, the noun who did the thing before the verb. So it would be the court issued an order. It's a more crisp sentence and it directs the reader to exactly what happened quickly and easily. Um, okay. So here's some, I'm gonna give you some more tips. Try to use short sentences and paragraphs because when you use, I mean, you may not only use short ones, but, um, but when possible, use short sentences, pithy state statements, because they, they pack a larger punch. Um, the longer the sentence, the more likely it is that the reader can be confused. So if you have a compound sentence, then think about making it into two short sentences. Also, build your sentences around the active verbs. Okay, so think about what you're trying to say and make sure that you're identifying what the noun is. So who, who did it? The court, the boy, the bus, the 
you know, the person, the, the dog? And then what is the verb? What is the act? Did it bite? Did it decide? Did it order? Did it whatever it did? And then um, the object. So make sure that you're thinking about it in that way. So an example is, um, you know, instead of, like you can think of, let's, let's say police searched a house. If you write it down and say the house was searched by police, that's going to be um, less, less powerful than saying police searched the house, right? If you say the house was searched, you're still wondering, well, when, by who, it could be anything, and then you get to the police. And if it's a longer, more complicated sentence, it takes you even longer and more, it, may, it could be more difficult to get to that point. So now, instead of saying the house was searched by police, say, police searched the house. Shorter, crisper, more direct. Um, so let me, let, me, let me give another um, sentence here. And, we, and you're going to help me make it shorter and in the active voice. So let me go to... Um, Elidi. Yes. Okay. So the sentence is this. The defendants made a request for a continuance. And I'll write it down. So how can you shorten that and put it in the active voice? Hmm. The defendant requested a continuance? Yes. So, it, so the, and by the way, I guess this is, um, this is already in the active voice, but you shortened it by saying uh, the defendant requested a continuance. You see, you see those two sentences? It really does make a difference in reading them. Um, and that you don't, you don't need to say made a request. You could just say the defendant requested. And then instead of for a continuance, just requested a continuance. Okay? Now, there may be a situation though, like how did the defendant make a continuance? I mean, you may have to say, in order to give more precision and detail, you might have to say, you know, the the defendant moved um, uh, for a continuance. So, you, so that's also, you know, you, you kept it short and you now you're a little more precise about the verb. Um, okay. So now some, some things about style. I'm, I want to try to go through this quickly because some of them you, you already know. The first is, do not use contractions. Um, that's one way where, you know, in colloquial English, talking to one another, sometimes uh, we use contract. we almost always use contractions, but in legal writing, just don't do it. Don't do contractions. Um, also, don't write in the first person. So you don't want to ever say, I this or I that. You always want to talk about the court or you can or talk about you know others, but it, you you lose I think the gravitas and you lose credibility when you're when you're talking about I in legal writing. So 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 generally legal writing. Just, there is a judge I knew who used to do, who, and sometimes you'll see this uh, when you read court opinions. Sometimes judges will write in the first person like I decide this or I believe that, and unless it's like a Supreme Court judge, it just it comes off as kind of weird in my view. It's not great legal writing in my view. Um, it's okay. Don't use slang unless you're, unless you're like quoting. And by the way, quoting is kind of an exception to a lot of things. If you're quoting, um, you know, what someone said, then you obviously, you, you can't really correct that. Um, it's just a quote. But don't use slang like, don't say, um, 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 the plaintiff's car was totaled. 
Okay. Instead, say the plaintiff's car was wrecked. Don't say the defendant ripped off the stereo. Say the defendant stole the stereo. Okay. So think about how you, how the reader is looking at it, and um, and and make sure that you're you're using um, proper um, formal wording, even though sometimes. It may, you know, as you'll see down the road, some creative legal writing, they, you know, that people do start using slang and, and being more um, uh, colloquial if they're trying to, to hit a point really hard. But as an initial matter, and certainly in law school, you want to make sure, like, if you're going to say someone was drunk, don't say the defendant was smashed. Don't say the defendant was drunk. Okay. I have a question. Sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, for some reason, I can't hear you. Let's see. Um, so um, you, you were mentioning how we like should simplify most of our, our writing and, you know, use very um, straight terms. Um, how, how would you, um, I guess, I guess, uh, consider the fact that we're reading some of the opinions that we're reading use very flowery language. And I mean, especially if you, some of the more uh, old um, and, and outdated cases, you know, the language is very flowery, in some cases complex. And that for me, sometimes it just inf influences the way I write. Um, so I, mean, I don't know, it's not really a question, but how would you, what would you say about that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, it's um, maybe in the right place and time, you can write like that. Like when you're a federal judge and um, you can decide to write in a flowery and funky way. Um, I guess it, that comes with, with it. And, 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 and in the old times, not old times, even up until like the 70s, legal writing was, was more verbose. And there was almost this like, um, it almost feels like there was this agreement among attorneys that if we used weird words, then people will pay us for writing them. You know, it's like our pact to use our own separate language. And that has really changed. It's it, now, nowadays, good legal writing is simple. It's easy to understand for anybody. And it's to the point. Um, I think the way to, um, um, to think about a lot of the way that some of that writing is done is you can even take a sentence from some of those and, and cut out half the words in a sentence and the sentence is actually better and more clear. Like for example, if you said, um, you know, um, almost any time if, if you see a word like there to or forthwith or um, here and after, <laughs> all this crap like literally if you just take your pen and strike that word the sentence says the same exact thing there's just a, like a lot of needless verbiage out there um so um so yeah i mean i would say get you know another piece of advice is is um um you know, you want to be serious in your writing. Don't don't try to make jokes um, at this stage in, in your career. Um, if you're going to do like underlining or or bold to emphasize something, you definitely get the sign off from your uh, writing professor that they're okay with that, and definitely use it sparingly. Um, you want to you know make sure that you are. Um, very basic stuff. Use use conventional typeface. Make sure you're using the right fonts. Make sure, I mean, you know, like this is relevant because your, your writing professors are going to say, I want this to be in this type font, one page uh, um, margins and stuff. Really pay attention and follow that because in the legal world, following those kinds of instructions is important because um, as a matter of fairness, because people see it as like process. And a lot of times courts have their own, like judges have their own standards for how they want um, the attorneys to write in. And so it shows that you're able to follow those kinds of instructions. So make sure that you, that you follow those instructions carefully. 
um, you know, like using right justification unless, unless they want a different kind of justification. Um, and don't try to cheat on type size or line spacing or margins. Make sure that you are following the, um, in your writing class what, what the professor wants. Make sure you know what the professor wants. Usually they, they do give instruction on that. Um, make sure for also, for example, that you don't have a heading at the bottom of the page. Sometimes that's called um, widows and orphans. So you want to keep you want to keep the paper looking, um, looking good um, and clear. Make sure to indent your paragraphs. Uh, make sure to master the apostrophe. So for example, um, if you're saying, if you want to say that, that, um, you know, that somebody's lawyer was present, present, you say the, the party's lawyer was present. Does that, how, where do you put the apostrophe there? I'm gonna write the sentence. So there's the sentence. Can somebody, um, can somebody, uh, even more than one person, in the word parties, where does the apostrophe go? Does anyone disagree with Nicole? Okay. So that's a possessive, right? And now, now here's another sentence. All of the party's lawyers were present. So where does the apostrophe go there? That's right. Everyone's right. So you form the possessive of a singular noun by adding an apostrophe followed by an S. And you form the possessive of a plural noun by adding an apostrophe after the S. And there are a couple exceptions, okay? So when a plural noun doesn't normally end in S, add an apostrophe followed by S, by an S. So it's like, um, by women, becomes women's. And um, if you wouldn't add another S or Z sound to a singular noun, you can add just the apostrophe without an S. So for example, um, courts of appeals, becomes courts of um, appeals. But if, you, but if you would add an S or a Z sound, then you add an apostrophe and an S to a singular noun, even if it already add, ends in S. So for example, Congress becomes Congresses. So do you understand what that means? It means it means you're using the way you would know that that it's said, in thinking about when a when a word ends in s, whether to put an apostrophe before or or, or after. Courts of appeals, you would say um, the courts of appeals decision is what a, the, or the courts of appeals decided, right? So you wouldn't say the courts of appeals is decided, but if you say Congress is um, if you say, if you want to say Congress possesses something, like um, um, Congress's ability, you would you do add another S sound, Congress's ability. So you you add an apostrophe S. Okay. Um, don't be a slasher. Don't use this ever. Okay. Unless there's an except, there could be some exceptions. But um, instead, explain, explain things out. Okay? 
So for example, if someone was a professor and researcher, you would say, um, you know, um, Joe was a professor. So, so if somebody changed this sentence and get rid of the slash, how would you get rid of that? The sentence that starts with Joe. Anybody? Yes, exactly, um, Brantley. So you want to say, um, and that's another construction, Brant, that you can use. So just don't don't use a slash. Use use and instead, or or, or what it actually is. Um, Also, you want to look at um, you want to look at the serial comma. Okay, so some people you you, you want to ask your professor about um, about whether the serial. So, what does anyone know what the serial comma is? When you're listing three things, you know how you do, um, for example, swimming, walking, and running. Most of the time, people do include a serial comma. So it would be, you know, swimming, walking, and running. But some, but some people get rid of that last comma, okay? So you wanna make sure you know um, what, what, the, what the preference is. Both can be okay. Make sure that you capitalize things correctly. Notice what you're capitalizing and what you're not capitalizing. Don't capitalize every word having anything to do with the law. The normal rule of capitalization is applied to legal writing too. So, um, you know, you can look on, you can look at the blue book and, and it has, it, it explains, uh, it has an area of capitalization that, um, that explains this out. Also, you know, don't abbrevi you know, if you're going to do abbreviations, make sure that they're blue book friendly. Or do you guys, by the way, if any of you use old instead of blue book, can you tell me? You can text, you can put it in the chat or you can just say it. Drake does what? Uses what? Uses old. Okay. Okay. Everyone does, do, do, what about um, Idaho, Mitchell, and Vermont? Vermont uses a blue book. Okay, so everyone else uses blue book. So it's just Drake on its own there with all. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna stop with the tips for now. Um, one thing before we go, can I just have someone from each university tell me what your writing um, um, assignment is for this semester, your final writing assignment? Is it a brief? Is it a memo? Like, what is it? And you can, you know, each school can just say, and if, <clears throat> if there's differences between in the same school, then you can let me know. But just, can we go with Drake first? So, Drake's is the brief. The brief is due tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Like, the, the final? Yeah, our final writing assignment is due tomorrow. Oh, boy. I wish I had more time. Okay, and um, Idaho? The appellate brief. When's it due? April 6th. Mitchell? Mitchell has an appellate brief. We have an oral to April 24th. Uh, Vermont? We have a judicial opinion, and it's due March 6th. 
I think ours. Or, I think it varies from class to class. Oh, oh yeah. In our section with Laura, it's different. Yeah, okay, so. we have a um, we have an appellate brief. Um, I'm not sure when it's due. I know the first draft is due March eighth. And that's Vermont. That's Vermont. Does anyone else have something different in Vermont or in any other schools? Okay, so um, our time is up. Mine, sorry, mine's due April 3rd. It's different for everybody depending on what class we have. Okay, so the due date may be different. And Oh, uh, also, oh, just a correction. I, for our section, it's March 9th. I gave you the wrong date. I gave you Monday. Okay. For our judicial opinion. Okay. And uh, but Drake, after you guys hand this in tomorrow, you're you're like done with legal writing for the year. We're not necessarily done. We start um, the first year or arguments the week after, and then after that, we're basically done. I see. You, Drake, um, so so okay. First of all, let me just um, say to all of you. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I know the Oscars are on and I know you have studying to do and um, I, I hope that this was useful. Please email me if you want to hear more about something or less about something. I'm here to help you. I want to see you succeed. So if you're- if I just wanted to say on behalf of Drake that we all thank you and we're so appreciative of your time and you taking the time out to speak with us and we really do appreciate it and that's from all of us thank you so much i appreciate that um and i do want to say everyone who's not from drake you guys can go but the drake folks since your assignment is due tomorrow i want to stay on for a little bit if you have questions if you don't have questions let's get off the phone so you can go work but if you want to ask me a question a general question i'm happy to take it Anyone from Drake? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I'm basically going through my like tenth read through of my brief to make sure I, I didn't miss anything and cited correctly, and have a strong argument or at least an argument that I'm happy with and can flow logically. Okay. Good. So I think my I think my problem with the brief is like my point headings and my subheadings. That's the only thing that is mostly difficult but so I, some issues with? yeah so i i was in my professor's office for a very long time to discuss her discuss with her about it but other than that it just it's due tomorrow <laughs> that's it are you there jasmine yes yes i am okay um for your headings uh, think about, are you on Twitter? Me? No, I'm not on Twitter. Well, think about I try not to use social media during the school year. Good for you. I don't use social media much at all. But, but the tweets are kind of like how headings should look. A really well-written tweet. It's like, it's just to the point. Um, it's simple. And it, you know, it, 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 it allows the reader to understand what's coming in the rest of the paper. Is there something in particular like that that's that's tough? Um, I don't think so. Only because I, based on the honor code, I can't tell you a lot yeah. of what's going on in the brief because it'd be violating it, which no, I know. I'm sucks, just saying, like, if it but it comes to um, like like you know, make sure you're doing what your professor wants you to do. But generally, mm -hmm. for any, like, you know, a lot of them are just like complete full sentences that summarize, that's like a good capsule summary of, of what's going to, of what's going to be in the next section. Um, yeah, so I guess for one of my point headings, um, one of, so the topic is on standing, constitutional standing, which I think it's fine. Not, I'm not telling you the exact provision that we're looking at in a certain document.